Hello and welcome to uh, this presentation of uh, Statesgate Theory and Practice. My name is Nestor B. Aquino and this is a presentation of Group A for Weeks 4 and 5 and for our Seminar in Program and Portfolio Management course DDBA 8570-1. I am broadcasting and presenting this to you today, May 31st, 2015, from Colorado Springs, Colorado, USA. For our agenda today, um, we will be discussing about the stage gate process, organizational governance, the balance scorecard, reasons for project termination and reluctance to terminate projects, and as evidence of uh, these processes, uh, I can give the successful companies that uh, have, Im have implemented this uh, theories. Let's begin with state's gate process. State's gate process is a sequential system that are separated by uh, stages uh, wherein there are activities and analysis uh, that equates to certain deliverables or outputs and each stage um, has got also the different deliverables and the based on different criteria to produce the output. The different stages of this are scoping, building a business case, development, testing and validation and until the end result of the launching of the innovation process. In the typical stage gate model there are five stages and um, these are the pre-work designed to discover and uncover business opportunities and generating new ideas. This is actually the uh, first stage which is the idea screen. The next one is the scoping and the scoping which is the stage one it's actually a quick and a preliminary investigation analysis of the project um, or a uh, it is an inexpect, inexpensive uh, desk research normally uh, business analysts do this stage two is the building the business case is a detailed investigation involving uh, pr primary research, both in the market the technical, and leading to a business case included product and project definition, justification, and the proposed plan for development. Stage three is the development, the actual detailed design and development of the new product, and the design and operation or production processes required for eventual full-scale production. Stage four is actually quality control, wherein testing and validation happens, and this happens in a laboratory, a plant to verify and validate the proposed new product, the brand, the marketing plan, production and operation strategies. The final stage is the launching. It's actually the, what they call commercialization. It's the beginning of full-scale operation our production and marketing and selling. There are different benefits according to uh, research and benchmarking firms. Many companies implemented the stage gate process had accomplished or realized accelerated speed to market, increased new product success rates, decreased new product failures, increase in organizational discipline and focus on the right projects. There were experiencing fewer errors, less waste, and less rework within the project. There are also certain improved alignment across the business leaders. There is efficiency and effective allocation of the resources. There is improved visibility of all projects in the pipeline improved cross-functional engagement and collaboration among the teams and improved communication and coordination with external stakeholders. 
Now let's go to the organizational governance according to Tu and Weber um, for a conceptual framework. A certain organization has to govern the organization efficient, efficiently and um, based on uh, vision, ethical, and customer service relationships. And th this is what we call uh, the petal diagram. It's like a flower and the different petals represent the different aspects or components in the organization that has to be governed perfectly. The topmost is the governing relationships where the company has got its relationship with the communities external and it's protecting its reputation with the authorities and with the stakeholders. And then this is actually um, the basis for strategic planning. Portfolio and program and project management are based on strategic plans. And this is actually the second petal, which is the governing change. With the project portfolio and program management, there is also organizational change management. And also, at this point, they can realize the benefits. The third petal is governing the organization's people, where human resources departments involve policies and procedures and the different motivation and leadership strategies are being applied by top management and the middle management and other areas, other levels of management. The fourth petal is actually financial governance. This is where the money comes from, the funding, where there is a shareholder value, there is a taxation and reporting and long-term return on investment is being projected and realized. The other, the, the fifth and final petal on this petal diagram is the governing and viability and sustainability. With it, the organization has to be governed in order for there is a resilience and continuity of the business. There should be a non-stagnation of the business. That means innovation and development has to be promoted. Resilience to competitors. There should be a technology and infrastructure development to leverage technology in its processes. And also the governing environmental factors to strengthen the company. The nested governance diagram shows the different levels of management. The governance is from the board of directors and then the management from the executive level down to the middle and frontline managers. As we can see in this diagram, the project management system and the project delivery system or enterprise project management with its sponsor is being run by the middle and frontline managers. The executives monitor this in the management system and the board of direct directors are using other systems and government entities in their governance system with external stakeholders of the organization. As we can see, the involvement in governance and the decision making progressively reduces requirements to comply with governance objectives as remains unchanged. Let me show you the value chain, which is actually one of the most important basis of this governance. It, it tells a sequential components where uh, there's a project management domain and organizational management domain. Basically, the project management side of it will be the development and organizational management domain will be the operational part of it once it is implemented. It started with innovation. These are the new ideas that come up 
for example, the Apple Corporation may now be innovating iPhone 7 or uh, iPhone 6 Plus S. We don't know what's the name of that new innovative product that they are thinking. And then there is a selection process. In the selection process, it's being prioritized. And in the governance, this is also a part where the top management has to be aligning the strategic goals of the organization to determine which project to pursue and which projects to set aside. The project, once initiated, will have to have a project manager that will manage these projects. The project is expected to produce an output just in case that the project is pursued. Otherwise, if it is terminated prior to completion, then the project is said to be aborted. Once the project continues to be completed, it is now being used by the organization, signified by the diamond figure here in this diagram. And then once used by the organization, the outcomes are being measured. And this is where certain key performance indicators are used. There is a strategic alignment or line of sight to the strategies that was anticipated when the project was initiated and this is to be evaluated as to the benefits gained by the organization. The selection and evaluation criteria can be used in the balance scorecard framework. From the diagram on the right, we can see that the vision and strategy is the very center of this diagram. And it is in a circular clockwise or counterclockwise, whatever it comes, it, it is a concentric to the vision and strategy of the organization. The topmost determines the financial performance. To the right, counterclockwise uh, clockwise is the internal business process, which determines the efficiency of the project. Towards the bottom, there is organizational capacity on the knowledge and innovation, where strategic objectives, strategy maps, performance measurement and targets and strategy initiatives are being compared. And then finally, it also determines whether it satisfied the customer and the stakeholders of the project. The balance scorecard will also be discussed in the next slides and how it relates to project program and portfolio management and its relation to balance scorecard or what we, an acronym of BSC. Let's discuss now about the benefits and limitations of using the balance scorecard. As we have known initially, the benefits of the balance scorecard is that it aligns with strategic and vision of the organization. However, this has got limitations and Jacobson and Lueg specify that there is a limitation in the controllability of the balance scorecard by middle managers. And these are related to ethical reasons and also the mismanagement side of it. I can say that in reality, it's not the limitation. It's the human factor the, of the ma middle managers not actually doing the right things to implement the balanced scorecard framework. Also, the BSC, as one of its limitations, is not a one-size-fits-all. Perry, in its blog, and I retreat brought from the Balanced Scorecard Institute website, 
a relative of him was asking, I would like to implement the balanced scorecard in our organization. Can you give me some examples? Well, actually, following examples is not the way, right way to do it because a balanced scorecard of another company may not be applicable to the balanced scorecard of other companies. That means it's a case-to-case -case basis. And therefore, Dr. Kaplan, in one of the interviews, admitted that companies wanting balanced scorecard may need consultants. And based on my experience, consultants are needed when there's complexity that the organization is facing. And when there's complexity, that means the balanced scorecard, I can conclude as a limitation is that it may be complicated to implement in certain organizations. Herman brain dominance has been mentioned in the outline of the requirements of this presentation. And with it, I have compared the brain model Herman as he formulated the different ways of thinking of people and presented it into four quadrants. Then let's just correlate that to the balance scorecard for a project based in relation to the Herman model. As we can see Herman brain dominance, for example, is an instrument, is a system to measure and describe the thinking preferences in people. This was developed by William Ned Herman while leading management in education at General Electric Crotonville facility. It is a type of uh, measurement and model, and it's comparable to psychological assessments such as Myers-Briggs type indicator for we are diagnosed whether our preference is we are an introvert or extrovert. And then we have also other um, indicators such as uh, learning orientation questionnaire and the DISC assessment. Kaplan and Norton developed the concept of using the balance scorecard to measure the effectiveness of an organization. And uh, we know that this concept can also be used to measure project performance. The idea is that most measures focus exclusively on financial aspect and business and fail to consider long-term strategies developing human resources, knowledge, management, and others. So let's go to the first quadrant A, logical, analytical, fact-based, quantitative, technical. If the thinking of the stakeholders at this quadrant it is expected on the balanced scorecard, based on the Herman model, there's a measurable performance outcome. Financial outcomes, the return on investment, the e-products and technical results, and research data and analysis. Going counterclockwise on the lower quadrant B, people thinking organization, sequential, planning, detailed, and controlling, will yield administrative plans and policies, process improvement, operational efficiencies, quality and improvement. Then quadrant C is for interpersonal, feeling-based, kinesthetic, emotional, and spiritual. And this will relate to balanced scorecard on team process and effectiveness, customer stakeholder relationship, training development, achievements, communication effectiveness. And the last quadrant D, people thinking holistic, integrating, intuitive, synthesizing, and the big picture will correspond to the concept or model development, strategy, strategic thinking, ideation, creativity, and innovation, and global cultures. As we can see, 
The A quadrant deals with familiar financial measures and other numerical data. The B quadrant focuses on policies and procedures and controls. The C quadrant provides focus on people training and development of employees. And quadrant D concerns long-range planning, positioning the organization or the future and dealing with concepts, strategies, and the big picture. So what is the desired outcome? How will we know it has been achieved? And so therefore, when we, know, we knew the desired outcomes, this approach will help us avoid focusing on financials. As an example, a project may meet all the targets and still be judged negatively by a major stakeholder. This may be because he was not treated as he expected to be treated as a C quadrant person. By paying attention to C quadrant factors from the very beginning, such kind of misconception can be minimized. Let's talk about reasons for project termination. And the first questions to ask when considering termination of unfinished project, because we can also terminate finished projects, but the scope of this presentation goes only for the unfinished ones. That's why I may call it an aborted project. So if the, one of the answers of these questions is a yes, then this is a candidate for the project sponsors, the project stakeholders, and the project manager to meet and conclude that the project should be stopped. The first one is, has the project been obviated by technical advances? Maybe a competitor, it, it, it um, gave a, uh, a new technical innovation much better than the other. If Samsung, Samsung um, made ahead of Apple and Apple became and a cell phone company, became more on a delayed launching, the project may not be pursued by Apple and say, we'll go to the next level higher than what our competitor had put in the market. Second is the output of the project is still cost effective. If the project became more expensive due to higher cost of materials in the market, or there's a, a volatility in the cost of, uh, of pursuing the project becomes um, impractical anymore and it's not feasible, then they have to decide to stop. Is it time to integrate or add the project as part of a regular operation? Maybe it's redundant. Are there better alternatives for the use of funds, time and personal debate devoted to the project? This may be a cost where the uh, project proponents will say, let's stop this project because um, we have a higher priority project that we have considered. The last bullet says, has a change in the environment altered the need for the project's output? Yes, the project can be stopped if the need for the project's output had changed negatively. Now, why are organizations or individuals in the project seem to hesitate or prevent or are reluctant to terminate such projects. While the communication dilemma, as senior managers are often unaware of the project's problems. Um, the senior managers are not informed ahead of time of what's going on, if it's a red flag that they need to know. Second, psychological and ethical reluctance of organizational members. Because we know we don't want to voice out bad news, negative information concerning a project and its status. The third bullet says information sometimes fails to be communicated up. It's related to the communication in the first bullet. And it's sometimes substantially distorted in the project. The project manager wants to always give a good news or even did not have a good communication plan. The project should have been probably a weekly status reporting, but then 
he opted to make it quarterly. It's too delayed for the timeliness of reporting has been distorted. And finally, as a summary, these are brought about by organizational behavior and communication, ethics, or economic reasons. The information system may be inappropriate, but then we cannot prevent considering the psychological reasons of the people that are in the project. That's why they're reluctant to terminate them. Our last slide is for some benefits of some companies that are, have been successful with Statesgate and also the balance scorecard implementation. And references mention the following companies, the Mecklenburg County in North Carolina, the National Moral Donor Program, the Viola Water in North America, the Federal Ministry of Health in Ethiopia, Tolco Industries Limited, Shatter Field, Kenya Red Cross, Douglas County, uh, Colorado, the Army Surgeon General Commander of the United States Army Medical Command, and my company, I can vouch that Colorado Springs Utilities, my employer, has been successful company employing the Statescape process and also the balance scorecard. In our organization, the bottom line is whether the value chain diagram has been achieved wherein the company has gained the benefits more than the inputs or the cost of develop, developing the project. In that way, these are the common bottom line of the successful companies in engaging in this stage gate strategy and balance scorecard implementation. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening and watching over. Please provide your evaluation and feedback using our discussion forum for Group A. Thank you, Dr. Jean and my classmates, and you have a wonderful day.